freedom, freedom, freedom. My name is Dick Fernandez. I'm a minister in the United Church of Christ. And in 1967, I was the director of a group called Clergy and Laity Concerned, which was a protest group that came out of the Vietnam War. In 1966, Dr. King, on several occasions, gave voice to his concern about the war in Vietnam. He never really came out and delivered a full address, but he would make comment on it in various uh, places he spoke. And one time at Ebenezer Church, he devoted a whole sermon to the war in Vietnam. In any case, everything came to a head for Dr. King in January of 1967, when he was invited to be a speaker. In May of that year, down at the UN, before tens of thousands of people protesting the war. Now he had to either say yay or nay. He spent the next four or five weeks talking to everybody he could, trying to get advice as to whether it was wise whether he should make a speech, whether he should make a speech there. His staff and his board, his donors, his, some of his best supporters said it was a bad idea for many reasons. Two particularly kept coming up over and over again. It would cost SCLC a lot of money. People would back away from it as an organization to support. And second, and more importantly for some, they had spent, the civil rights movement had spent five years developing a relationship with Lyndon Johnson and burning this bridge on the war would not be a very smart thing to do, it was argued. King wrestled with all these issues and in the end he said, I'm sorry, I have to do this. My conscience will let me do no other. When we came over to the church, it was packed, over 2000 people inside and probably that many people outside with loudspeakers. It was electric inside, up front on the podium. There were so many microphones on the podium, I thought the podium might fall over. Near the end of his speech, he laid out really what the future agenda was for the religious community of this country. When he mentioned racism, poverty, and militarism as issues to be concerned about in the future. And indeed, those are the issues we are concerned about to this day. After the speech, in every newspaper, daily newspaper in the country, he was criticized. Uh, he was criticized up and down in the black community, particularly from the leadership. King never backed away from that speech. I was with him on several occasions where he, without even blinking an eyelash, said it was one of the most important moments of my life. So he underscored the importance of it, even as he was being shredded in the press and criticized by people who had been longtime friends. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I need not pause to say how very delighted I am to be here tonight and how very delighted I am to see you expressing your concern about the issues that will be discussed tonight by turning out in such large numbers. I also want to say that I consider it a great honor to share this program with Dr. Bennett, Dr. Comager, and Rabbi Heschel, and some of the distinguished leaders and personalities of our nation. And of course, it's always good to come back to Riverside Church, 
Over the last eight years, I've had the privilege of preaching here almost every year in that period, and it is always a rich and rewarding experience to come to this great church and this great pulpit. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I join you in this meeting because I'm in deepest agreement with the aims and work of the organization which has brought us together, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. The recent statements of your executive committee are the sentiments of my own heart. And I found myself in full accord when I read its opening lines, a time comes when silence is betrayal. And that time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. The truth of these words is beyond doubt, but the mission to which they call us is a most difficult one. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in time of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought within one's own bosom and in the surrounding world. Moreover, when the issues at hand seem as perplexing as they often do in the case of this dreadful conflict, we are always on the verge of being mesmerized by uncertainty, but we must move on. And some of us who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often a vocation of agony. But we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision. But we must speak. And we must rejoice as well. For surely this is the first time in our nation's history that a significant number of its religious leaders have chosen to move beyond the prophesying of smooth patriotism to the high ground of a firm dissent based upon the mandates of conscience and the reading of history. Perhaps a new spirit is rising among us. If it is, let us trace its movement and pray that our own inner being may be sensitive to its guidance, for we are deeply in need of a new way beyond the darkness that seems so close around us. Over the past two years, I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences and to speak from the burnings of my own heart as I have called for radical departures from the destruction of Vietnam. Many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. At the heart of their concern, this query has often loomed large and loud. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the voices of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. Aren't you hurting the cause of your people, they ask? And when I hear them, though I often understand the source of their concern, I am nevertheless greatly saddened, for such questions mean that the inquirers have not really known me, my commitment, or my calling. Indeed, their questions suggest that they do not know the world in which they live. In the light of such tragic misunderstanding, I deem it of signal importance to try to state clearly, and I trust concisely, why I believe that the path from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the church in Montgomery, Alabama, where I began my pastorate, leads clearly to this sanctuary tonight. I come to this platform to make a passionate plea to my beloved nation. This speech is not addressed to Hanoi or to the National Liberation Front. It is not addressed to China or to Russia, nor is it an attempt to overlook the ambiguity of the total situation and the need for a collective solution to the tragedy of Vietnam. Neither is an attempt to make North Vietnam or the National Liberation Front paragons of virtue, nor to overlook the role they must play in the successful resolution of the problem. While they both may have justifiable reasons to be suspicious of the good faith of the United States, life and history 
give eloquent testimony to the fact that conflicts are never resolved without trustful give and take on both sides. Tonight, however, I wish not to speak to Hanoi and the National Liberation Front, but rather to my fellow Americans. Since I am a preacher by calling, I suppose it is not surprising that I have seven major reasons for bringing Vietnam into the field of my moral vision. There is at the outset a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam and I watched this program broken and eviscerated as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor so long as adventures like Vietnam continued to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and die in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. And so we had been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. And so we watched them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village. But we realized that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. My third reason moves to an even deeper level of awareness for it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of the North over the last three years, especially the last three summers. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I cannot be silent. For those who ask the question, aren't you a civil rights leader? And thereby mean to exclude me from the movement for peace, I have this further answer. In 1957, when a group of us formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we chose as our motto, to save the soul of America. We were convinced that we could not limit our vision to certain rights for black people, but instead affirmed the conviction that America would never be free or saved from itself until the descendants of its slaves were loosed completely from the shackles they still wear. In a way, we were agreeing with Langston Hughes, that black bard of Harlem who had written earlier, oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Now it should be incandescently clear 
that no one who has any concern for the integrity and life of America today can ignore the present war. If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam. It can never be saved so long as it destroys the deepest hopes of men the world over. So it is that those of us who are yet determined that America will be are, are led down the path of protest and dissent, working for the health of our land. As if the weight of such a commitment to the life and health of America were not enough, another burden of responsibility was placed upon me in 1954. And I cannot forget that the Nobel Peace Prize was also a commission a commission to work harder than I had ever worked before for the brotherhood of man. This is a calling that takes me beyond national allegiances. But even if it were not present, I would yet have to live with the meaning of my commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ. To me, the relationship of this ministry to the making of peace is so obvious that I sometimes marvel at those who ask me why I'm speaking against the war. Could it be that they do not know that the good news was meant for all men, for communists and capitalists, for their children and ours, for black and for white, for revolutionary and for conservative? Have they forgotten that my ministry is in obedience to the one who loved his enemies so fully that he died for them? What then can I say to the Viet Cong or to Castro or to Mao as a faithful minister of this one? Can I threaten them with death or must I not share with them my life? And finally, as I try to explain for you and for myself the road that leads from Montgomery to this place, I would have offered all that was most valid if I simply said that I must be true to my conviction that I share with all men the calling to be a son of the living God. Beyond the calling of race or nation or creed is this vocation of sonship and brotherhood. And because I believe that the father is deeply concerned, especially for his suffering and helpless and outcast children, I come tonight to speak for them. This I believe to be the privilege and the burden of all of us who deem ourselves bound by allegiances and loyalties which are broader and deeper than nationalism and which go beyond our nation's self-defined goals and positions. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for the victims of our nation and for those it calls enemy for no document from human hands can make these humans any less our brothers. As I ponder the madness of Vietnam and search within myself for ways to understand and respond in compassion, my mind goes constantly to the people of that peninsula. I speak now not of the soldiers of each side, not of the ideologies of the Liberation Front, not of the Junta in Saigon, but simply of the people who've been living under the curse of war for almost three continuous decades now. And I think of them too, because it's clear to me that there'll be no meaningful solution there until some attempts are made to know them and hear their broken cries. They must see Americans as strange liberators. The Vietnamese people proclaimed their own independence in 1945 after a combined French and Japanese occupation and before the communist revolution in China. They were led by Ho Chi Minh, even though they quoted the American Declaration of Independence and their own document of freedom. We refused to recognize them. Instead, we decided to support France in its reconquest of her former colony. Our government felt then that the Vietnamese people were not ready for independence. And we again fell victim to the deadly Western arrogance that has poisoned the international atmosphere for so long. With that tragic decision, we rejected a revolutionary government seeking self-determination and a government that had been established not by China, 
for whom the Vietnamese have no great love, but by clearly indigenous forces that included some communists. For the peasants, this new government meant real land reform, one of the most important needs in their lives. For nine years following 1945, we denied the people of Vietnam the right of independence. For nine years, we vigorously supported the French in their abortive attempt to recolonize Vietnam. Before the end of the war, we were meeting 80% of the French war costs. Even before the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, they began to despair of their reckless action. But we did not. We encouraged them with our huge financial and military supplies to continue the war, even after they had lost the will. And soon we would be paying almost the full costs of this tragic attempt at recolonization. After the French were defeated, it looked as if independence and land reform would come again through the Geneva Agreement. But instead there came the United States determined that Ho should not unify the temporarily divided nation and the peasants watched again as we supported one of the most vicious modern dictators, our chosen man, Premier Ziem. Peasants watched and cringed as Ziem ruthlessly rooted out all opposition, supported their extortionist landlords and refused even to discuss reunification with the North. The peasants watched as all this was presided over by United States influence, and then by increasing numbers of US troops who came to quell the insurgency that Ziem's methods had aroused. When Ziem was overthrown, they may have been happy, but the long line of military dictators seemed to offer no real change, especially in terms of their need for land and peace. The only change came from America. As we increased our troop commitments in support of governments which were singularly corrupt, inept, and without popular support. All the while the people read our leaflets and received regular promises of peace and democracy and land reform. Now they languish under our bombs and consider us not their fellow Vietnamese, the real enemy. They move sadly and apathetically as we herd them off their land of their fathers into concentration camps where minimal social needs are rarely met. They know they must move or be destroyed by our bombs. So they go, primarily women and children and the aged. They watch as we poison their water, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They must weep as the bulldozers roll through their areas, preparing to destroy the precious trees. They wander into the hospitals with at least 20 casualties from American firepower for one vehicle inflicted injury. So far, we may have killed a million of them, mostly children. They wander into the towns and see thousands of the children, homeless, without clothes, running in the parks on the streets like animals. They see the children degraded by our soldiers as they beg for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers, soliciting for their mothers. What do the peasants think as we are allied ourselves with the landlords and as we refuse to put any action into our many words concerning land reform? What do they think as we test out our latest weapons on them, just as the Germans tested out new medicines and new tortures in the concentration camps of Europe? Where are the rules of the independent Vietnam we claim to be building? Is it among these voiceless ones? We have destroyed their two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. We have destroyed their land and their crops. We have cooperated in the question, in the question of the nation's only non-communist revolutionary political force, the unified Buddhist church. We have supported the enemies of the peasants of Saigon. We have corrupted their women and children and killed their men.
Now there's little left to build on, save bitterness. Soon the only solid, solid physical foundations remaining will be found at our military bases and in the concrete of the concentration camps we call fortified hamlets. The peasants may well wonder if we plan to build our new Vietnam on such grounds as these. Could we blame them for such thoughts? We must speak for them and raise the questions they cannot raise. These two are our brothers. Perhaps a more difficult but not less necessary task is to speak for those who have been designated as our enemies. What of the National Liberation Front, that strangely anonymous group we call VC or communists? What must they think of the United States of America when they realize that we permitted the repression and cruelty of DM, which helped to bring them into being a resistance group in the South? What do they think of our condoning the violence which led to their own taking up of arms? How can they believe in our integrity when we now speak of aggression from the North as if there were nothing more essential to the war? How can they trust us when now we charge them with violence after the murderous reign of Diem and charge them with violence while we pour every new weapon of death into their land? Surely we must understand their feelings even if we do not condone their actions. Surely we must see that the men we supported pressed them to their violence. Surely we must see their own computerized plans of destruction simply dwarf their greatest acts. How do they judge us when our officials know that their membership is less than 25% communist and yet insist on giving them the blanket name? What must they be thinking when they know that we are aware of their control of major sections of Vietnam, and yet we appear ready to allow national elections in which this highly organized political parallel government will not have a part? They ask how we can speak of free elections when the Saigon press is censored and controlled by the military junta. And they are surely right to wonder what kind of new government we plan to help form without them, the only party in real touch with the peasants. They question our political goals and they deny the reality of a peace settlement from which they will be excluded. Their questions are frighteningly relevant. Is our nation planning to build on political myth again? and then shore it up upon the power of new violence? Here is the true meaning and value of compassion and nonviolence, when it helps us to see the enemy's point of view, to hear his questions, to know his assessment of ourselves. For from his view, we may indeed see the basic weaknesses of our own condition. And if we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers who are called the opposition. So too with Hanoi. In the north where our bombs now pummel the land and our minds endanger the waterways, we are met by a deep but understandable mistrust. To speak for them is to explain this lack of confidence in Western words and especially their distrust of American intentions now. In Hanoi are the men who led the nation to independence against the Japanese and the French, the men who sought membership in the French Commonwealth and were betrayed by the weakness of Paris and the willfulness of the colonial armies. It was they who led a second struggle against French domination at tremendous costs and then were persuaded to give up the land they control between the 13th and 17th parallel as a temporary measure at Geneva. After 1954, they watched us conspire with Ziem to prevent elections, which could have surely brought Ho Chi Minh to power over a united Vietnam. And they realized they had been betrayed again. When we ask why they do not leap to negotiate these things must be remembered. Also, it must be clear 
that the leaders of Hanoi considered the presence of American troops in support of the Ziem regime to have been the initial military breach of the Geneva Agreement concerning foreign troops. They remind us that they did not begin to send troops in large numbers and even supplies into the South until American forces had moved into the tens of thousands. Hanoi remembers how our leaders refused to tell us the truth about the earlier North Vietnamese overtures for peace, how the president claimed that none existed when they had clearly been made. Ho Chi Minh has watched as America has spoken of peace and built up its forces. And now he has surely heard the increasing international rumors of American plans for an invasion of the North. He knows the bombing and shelling and mining we are doing are part of traditional pre-invasion strategy. Perhaps only his sense of humor and of irony can save him when he hears the most powerful nation of the world speaking of aggression as it drops thousands of bombs on a poor, weak nation more than 800, rather 8,000 miles away from its shores. At this point, I should make it clear, while I have tried in these last few minutes to give a voice to the voiceless in Vietnam and to understand the arguments of those who are called enemy, I am as deeply concerned about our own troops there as anything else. For it occurs to me that what we are submitting them to in Vietnam is not simply the brutalizing process that goes on in any war where armies face each other and seek to destroy. We are adding cynicism to the process of death, for they must know after a short period there that none of the things we claim to be fighting for are really involved. Before long, they must know that their government has sent them into a struggle among Vietnamese, and the more sophisticated surely realize that we are on the side of the wealthy and the secure while we create a hell for the poor. Somehow, this madness must cease. We must stop now. I speak as a child of God and brother to the suffering poor of Vietnam. I speak for those whose land is being laid waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose culture is being subverted. I speak of the for the poor of America who are paying the double price of smashed hopes at home and death and corruption in Vietnam. I speak as a citizen of the world, for the world stands aghast at the path we have taken. I speak as one who loves America to the leaders of our own nation. The great initiative in this war is ours. The initiative to stop it must be ours. This is the message of the great Buddhist leaders of Vietnam Recently, one of them wrote these words, and I quote, Each day the war goes on, the hatred increases in the heart of the Vietnamese and in the hearts of those of humanitarian instinct. The Americans are forcing even their friends into becoming their enemies. It is curious that the Americans, who calculate so carefully on the possibilities of military victory, do not realize that in the process, they are incurring deep psychological and political defeat. The image of America will never again be the image of revolution, freedom, and democracy, but the image of violence and militarism. If we continue, there will be no doubt in my mind and in the mind of the world that we have no honorable intentions in Vietnam. If we do not stop our war against the people of Vietnam immediately, the world will be left with no other alternative than to see this as some horrible, clumsy, and even deadly game we have decided to play. The world now demands a maturity of America that we may not be able to achieve. It demands that we admit that we have been wrong from the beginning of our adventure in Vietnam, 
that we have been detrimental to the life of the Vietnamese people. The situation is one in which we must be ready to turn sharply from our present ways. In order to atone for our sins and errors in Vietnam, we should take the initiative in bringing a halt to this tragic war. I would like to suggest five concrete things that our government should do immediately to begin the long and difficult process of extricating ourselves from this nightmarish conflict. Number one, end all bombing in North and South Vietnam. Number two, declare a unilateral ceasefire and hope that such action will create the atmosphere for negotiation. Three, take immediate steps to prevent other battlegrounds in Southeast Asia by curtailing our military buildup in Thailand and our interference in Laos. Four, realistically accept the fact that the National Liberation Front has substantial support in South Vietnam and must thereby play a role in any meaningful negotiations and any future Vietnam government. Five, set a date that we will remove all foreign troops from Vietnam in accordance with the 1954 Geneva Agreement. Part of our ongoing, part of our ongoing commitment might well express itself in an offer to grant asylum to any Vietnamese who fears for his life under a new regime, which included the Liberation Front. Then we must make what reparations we can for the damage we have done. We must provide the medical aid that is badly needed, making it available in this country if necessary. Meanwhile, meanwhile, we in the churches and synagogues have a continuing task while we urge our government to disengage itself from a disgraceful commitment. We must continue to raise our voices and our lives if our nation persists in its perverse ways in Vietnam. We must be prepared to match actions with words by seeking out every creative method of protest possible. As we counsel young men concerning military service, we must clarify for them our nation's role in Vietnam and challenge them with the alternative of conscientious objection. I am pleased to say that this is a path now chosen by more than 70 students at my own alma mater, Morehouse College. And I recommend it to all who find the American course in Vietnam a dishonorable and unjust one. Moreover, I would encourage all ministers of draft age to give up their ministerial exemptions and seek status as conscientious objectors. These are the times for real choices and not false ones. We are at the moment when our lives must be placed online, on the line, if our nation is to survive its own folly. Every man of humane convictions must decide on the protest that best suits his convictions, but we must all protest. Now there is something seductively tempting about stopping there and sending us all off on what in some circles has become a popular crusade against the war in Vietnam. I say we must enter that struggle, but I wish to go on now to say something even more disturbing. The war in Vietnam is but a symptom of a far deeper malady within the American spirit. And if we ignore this sobering reality, we will find ourselves organizing clergy and layman concerned committees for the next generation. They will be concerned about Guatemala, Guatemala and Peru. They will be concerned about Thailand and Cambodia. They will be concerned about Mozambique and South Africa. We will be marching for these and a dozen other names and attending rallies without end, unless there is a significant and profound change in American life and policy. And so such thoughts take us beyond Vietnam, 
but not beyond our calling as sons of the living God. In 1957, a sensitive American official overseas said that it seemed to him that our nation was on the wrong side of a world revolution. During the past 10 years, we have seen emerge a pattern of suppression which has now justified the presence of US military advisors in Venezuela. This need to maintain social stability for our investments accounts for the counter-revolutionary action of American forces in Guatemala. It tells why American helicopters are being used against guerrillas in Cambodia and why American napalm and Green Beret forces have already been active against rebels in Peru. It is with such activity in mind that the words of the late John F. Kennedy come back to haunt us. Five years ago, he said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Increasingly, by choice or by accident, this is the role our nation has taken, the role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investments. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin. We must rapidly begin the shift from a theme-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will be only an initial act. One day, we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. With righteous indignation, it will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, in South America, only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say, this is not just. It will look at our alliance with the landed gentry of South America and say, this is not just. The Western arrogance of feeling that it has everything to teach others and nothing to learn from them is not just. A true revolution of values will lay a hand on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. This business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of peoples normally humane, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. America, the richest and most powerful nation in the world, can well lead the way in this revolution of values. There is nothing except a tragic death wish to prevent us from reordering our priorities so that the pursuit of peace will take precedence over the pursuit of war. There is nothing to keep us from molding a recalcitrant status quo with bruised hands until we have fashioned it into a brotherhood. 
the kind of positive revolution of values is our best defense against communism. War is not the answer. Communism will never be defeated by the use of atomic bombs or nuclear weapons. Let us not join those who shout war and through their misguided passions, urge the United States to relinquish its participation in the United Nations. These are days which demand wise restraints and calm reasonableness. We must not engage in a negative anti-communism, but rather in a positive thrust for democracy, realizing that our greatest defense is to take offensive action on behalf of justice. We must, with positive action, seek to remove those conditions of poverty, insecurity, and injustice which are the fertile soil in which the seed of discontent grows and develops. These are revolutionary times. All over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression, and out of the wounds of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. We in the West must support these revolutions. It is a sad fact that because of comfort, complacency, a morbid fear of communism, and our proneness to adjust to injustice, the Western nations that initiated so much of the revolutionary spirit of the modern world have now become the extreme anti-revolutionaries. This has driven many to feel that only Marxism has a revolutionary spirit. Therefore, communism is a judgment against our failure to make democracy real and follow through on the revolutions that we initiated. Our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go into a sometimes hostile world, declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. With this powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo and unjust mores and thereby speed the day when every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. A genuine revolution of values means in the final analysis that our loyalties must be ecumenical rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing and unconditional love for all men. This oft misunderstood and misinterpreted concept so readily dismissed by the Nietzsche's of the world as a weak and cowardly force has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of man. When I speak of love, I am not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I'm speaking of that force, which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door, which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let us hope that this spirit will become the order of the day. We can no longer afford to worship the God of hate or bow before the altar of retaliation. The oceans of history are made turbulent by the ever-rising tides of hate. History is cluttered with the wreckage of nations and individuals that pursued this 
self-defeating path of hate. As Arnold Toynbee says, love is the ultimate force that makes for the saving choice of life and good against the damning choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope in our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word. We are now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at flood, it ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is adamant to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. Omar Khayyam is right. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on. We still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. We must move past indecision to action. We must find new ways to speak for peace in Vietnam and justice throughout the developing world, a world that borders on our doors. If we do not act, we shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time, reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter, but beautiful, struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that the forces of American life militate against their rival as full men and we send our deepest regrets. Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings, of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost? The choice is ours. And though we might prefer it otherwise, we must choose in this crucial moment of human history. As that noble bard of yesterday, James Russell Lowell eloquently stated, once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide. In the strife of truth and falsehood, for the good or evil side. Some great cause, God's new Messiah, offering each the bloom or blight. And the choice goes by forever, twixt that darkness and that light. Though the cause of evil prosper, 
yet tis truth alone is strong. Though her portions be the scaffold, and upon the throne be wrong. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. And if we will only make the right choice, we will be able to transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of peace. If we will make the right choice, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. If we will make, if we will but make the right choice, we will be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Welcome to the next part of tonight's program. Uh, I'm Barbara Ransby. I'm a historian, writer, and longtime activist. I'm honored to moderate this section of the, of the webinar. We almost need to just pause and catch our breath after the power of those words. Um, I think looking at all those faces uh, reminds me of the breadth of our movement, the complexity of our movement, and the enormous, enormous potential to build on Dr. King's legacy which of course we know is also Ella Baker's legacy, Fannie Lou Hamer's legacy, Anne Braden's legacy, Diane Nash's legacy, and many more. By way of introduction, I wanna uh, just say that uh, tonight's uh, webinar will also have Spanish interpretation. Uh, hay interpretación en español disponible. Hay un botón en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Uh, we will leave time also for questions at the end. Uh, so please use the question and answer function on your screen uh, in about 40 minutes when we will segue to the question and answer section. I am really excited to be in conversation with these four panelists tonight. We all know as we enter into this conversation on the anniversary of Dr. King's assassination, as well as the anniversary of the famed uh, Riverside Church speech, that the unfinished agenda of fighting war, poverty, and racism are still challenges very much with us today. 
as billionaires make over a trillion dollars during the pandemic while so many of our people are suffering, as militarism and war continue to decimate human life across the planet and racism is palpable everywhere. We need only look at the recent horrific spate of racist police killings to be reminded of that fact. So we're gonna be in conversation tonight with uh, four amazing panelists and I'm gonna introduce them each as they uh, make some opening remarks. We've asked them to respond to the speech but also uh, bring it up to the 21st century. Dr. King talked about the fierce urgency of now. So we wanna ground ourselves in the fierce urgency of now as we remember uh, those powerful words from 1967. Uh, with us tonight are Ashley Woodard, uh, Bill McKibben, Kareen Sanchez, and Medea Benjamin. And I will give uh, fuller introductions right before each panelist makes their opening uh, remarks. So we'll, we'll begin with my sister and colleague and comrade, Ashley Woodard. Ashley is the first uh, Black woman executive director of the Highlander Research and Education Center in Tennessee, former regional organizer for Project South, and one of the leaders in the movement for Black Lives, Frontline, and the Rising Majority. Ashley, What's your response to this speech in terms of your work and the challenges that we face today? Thank you so much, Dr. Ransby, and uh, to the National Council of Elders and all of you all that are gathered here in this sacred space to, to remember. I think the first thing that comes to mind after hearing the speech is we aren't the first, last, or only to be doing this work. I think about the incredible Vincent Harding, who was one of the primary authors of the Beyond Vietnam speech. I think about the, the incredible cadre of Black women uh, who made those Black men so fantastic, like Dorothy Cotton and Septima Clark before her and all of the others uh, before Ms. Clark. I think about what it means that we must speak <laughs> and we must rejoice. I feel like if 2020 didn't teach me anything else, it was that we have enough of our folks behind us, the wind in ourselves enough to build a movement that is powerful enough to fight to tear down all of the systems of oppression that harm us, while also celebrating and creating moments of joy. Right? We saw us fighting against capitalism, racialized patriarchal violence. We saw our movement sustain itself in the fight against white supremacist violence, whether it was from Charlottesville to what happened on January 6th. Our people are ready to rejoice to build a new world that we deserve while tearing down the old. What we also saw that feels relevant in the context of this powerful speech is that when black people speak up for what they deserve, when we demand what we want, when we build the alternative, we see this state, law enforcement and white supremacy do everything in its power to push back that Black people should only be able to talk about the race-based stuff, leave all of the rest of it alone is what they told Dr. King. I know that many of my colleagues in the Movement for Black Lives probably feel that too. Black people are making demands in a 21st century context, building on the leadership of folks like Dr. King, of folks in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, of folks in the Black Panther Party and more to say that when we talk about our people, we're talking about Black people here in the United States. We're talking about Black people all across the diaspora, and we're talking about all of our people in beloved community that are bending the moral arc of the universe towards justice beyond man-made borders and classes. I think it's important to remember that in this 21st century context, just in the 2020 fiscal year alone, the United States Department of Defense had a budget authority over $721 billion with a B with $8.9 billion in mandatory spending. Just to give you some comparison, the third rollout of the stimulus for our people was around $335 billion, right? We're spending more money to support military interventions in places like Palestine to the tune of $140 billion in economic and military aid to Israel. But we're having to demand that we not just bail out our banks and and, and not just buy more tanks, but actually invest in healthy, sustainable, and equitable communities for our people. We're, we're demanding a state that does not continue to fail us while spending so much money on these military interventions. I think we have to be honest that there's a movement that is making demands that are what our people deserve. 
I think about the vision for Black Lives Policy Platform that demands significant change in the U.S. in terms of our life, how we live it, how we relate to ourselves and to others, that pushes for policy that we deserve, that is transformative and not just putting platinum band-aids on the gaping wounds of our society, that shifts our value set in relationship to how law is created, how it is implemented, and how it is enforced. We are demanding the end of the war on Black people. We are demanding independent political power and building it ourselves. We are demanding community control over everything and self-governance and self-determination for all people. We're demanding economic justice. We're demanding that we divest from the continued systems of harm that Dr. King talked about in breaking the silence and an investment into our community into the solutions that, as Andrea Ritchie says, gets us a thousand miles ahead of the harm in the first place. We're demanding reparations. We're demanding that the Thrive Act be passed. We're demanding the Breathe Act. We're demanding the CARE Act, the PRO Act, and even more. This is our time. This is an opportunity to remember in the speech that there's a long legacy of radical resistance that is our inheritance. That this building of a multiracial solidarity effort for social and economic justice for all people, this Black and Asian diasporic solidarity is not new. That, that not only is those relation, are those relationships our inheritance, but also so is winning. Winning is our inheritance. We have been building the biggest social movement in U.S. history. We have been fighting and building together. That is our inheritance. And when we do that, when we build that work, when we fight back and we build the alternative, we win, beloved. I think it's important in the context of this speech to remember that Dr. King made it plain. There is no way that black people or any people can be free as long as capitalism, white supremacy and militarism exist. And none of us are free until all of us are free. Why does that matter, Ashley? I'm glad you asked. Because white supremacy and capitalism, militarism, and all the other systems of oppression that harm our communities are not partisan issues, beloved. What we know is that under fascist and authoritarian regimes, we see this, and under neoliberal regimes, we see this. This is the time where we need to be putting on even more pressure under a new administration to get what we've demanded, what we've deserved. Now is the time for our big we, our beloved community, the great cloud of witnesses to come together and say, now is our time. Dr. King said we had to use every creative method of protest possible. That remains true. Now is the time for us to be pushing for stronger recovery, big, bold champion of reparation, of repair, of justice, and that we have to do those things before there can be reconciliation, before there can be peace, right? That there is no neutrality when bending the moral arc of the universe towards justice. You are either supporting the fight for liberation or you are hindering its ability to be won. Now is our time to pick a side. Now is our time to break the silence, to demand what we deserve and to build our utopian vision into reality. Thank you so much. Amen, sister. Yes. So, so much there. Um, we're going to segue to our next speaker, um, Bill McKibben. Uh, Bill McKibben is a climate change leader, co-founder of 350.org, author of some 17 books or so. Most recently, uh, Falter, Has the Human Game Begun to Play Itself Out? He is past recipient of the Gandhi Peace Prize for his work on climate and environmental justice. Bill, your thoughts for us this evening. Well, Dr. Ansby, such a, so many thanks for letting me participate in this. Um, and, and first of all, just having listened to Reverend King and to, to Mahalia Jackson, perhaps just to say Happy Easter to all of those who celebrate. Um, this was a remarkable, remarkable evening. Um, in, in some ways quite personal for me, Riverside was my church for many years when I lived in New York and I've preached from that pulpit. And so it's possible for me to kind of imagine myself into the crowd that night, though I would only have been seven or eight at the time. Um, 
but also a reminder of just the extraordinary level of intellectual discourse with which Dr. King um, um, conducted himself. It's hard to imagine a speech that eloquent, that articulate, that nuanced, that faceted, and actually that long, um, um, being yeah. able to, anyone uh, making it today. Um, let me say that there are a few things right now that we can celebrate. Um, it was remarkable last week, and this builds on something that Ashley was saying. Remarkable last week to hear the Biden administration call for uh, spending trillions with a T on uh, infrastructure with a special emphasis on, on things that would help uh, uh, deal with climate change and that 40% of that money would be directed to the communities that have been hardest hit. In my lifetime, our country's only spent trillions of dollars on things that blow up and the wars in which we use them. Um, so it's, uh, there's a possibility of, 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 of new day coming of the kind that Dr. King foresaw. That said, to me, the most powerful thing in many ways about that um, speech was the way that it represented a kind of broadened understanding of the challenges that we face. And when one thinks about Dr. King's transit uh, from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church to moral conscience in many ways of, of um, much of the planet, it's a remarkable transition and, and, and one that wasn't his alone. There's this really powerful new joint biography of Malcolm X and Dr. King by Peniel Joseph that makes the point that uh, as they became more globalized in their understanding, as they traveled the world and looked out into it, they became steadily more radical in their understanding of what kind of change we needed. And I think that that probably would be even truer uh, for Dr. King at this moment in time. Uh, in that great um, poem, Hymn by James Russell Lowell that he quotes at the end, new occasions teach new duties. In some ways, the, the biggest single new occasion since his lifetime was probably the understanding that we are undermining at the very most basic level the physical life support systems of this planet, climate change being the best example. The first Earth Day was a year after his assassination, but I think that none of it would have uh, surprised him to learn. And the prescriptions that he put forward, especially the need to end both militarism and materialism as guiding principles in our lives are truer now than they ever were before. Um, we talk about the American assault with chemicals on the rest of the planet. Dr. King named napalm, but one could also as easily talk about carbon dioxide. No country on earth has put as much of it into the atmosphere as us pursuing our way of life. And now the victims of that assault are everywhere around the world. The iron law of climate change is the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you are hit. So the time is now to take serious action. And that action requires a global response. And it requires a response not only from our political leaders, but from those people at the other end of Manhattan, from Riverside Church, uh, a hundred blocks to the south on Wall Street, um, who were providing the financing for the fossil fuel industry that keeps this industry alive. And I have no doubt that were he in the pulpit of Riverside Church now, Dr. King would recall that Riverside Church had been built by John D. Rockefeller uh, and that uh, uh, the banks that the Rockefellers built, J.P. Morgan Chase, is now the biggest single financier of the fossil fuel industry on the planet. Uh, and that it is time, as the Rockefeller family has bravely said now over and over again, for that to end and that to shift. The world has changed much, but the ideas that Dr. King outlined, and especially the need for the movement that he helped build 
the vast nonviolent social movement that challenged the status quo at its deepest levels has never been more necessary than it is right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so Jill. much. Uh, uh, we we want to go now to Dr. Corrine Sanchez. Uh, Dr. Sanchez is the executive director of the Tewa Women United in Northern, Mex Northern New Mexico, uh, organization founded and led by Native women addressing issues of health, sexual violence, and the environment. Dr. Sanchez has worked in the field of sexual violence for 25 years, and we are eager to hear your remarks tonight, my sister. I think you're on mute. Sir, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Sorry about that. I'm in rural New Mexico. This is technical difficulties here. The digital divide <laughs> is real. <laughs> So, Sengiku, everyone, Uviat Gindi. It is a pleasure to be with you. Na Okua Pepovi Omu, Na Pohoge Owinge Iwiri Omu, Na Te Woman United Executive Director Omu. So, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, pleased to be here with all of the esteemed speakers and our moderator. Um, it was a uh, heartfelt listening to the um, reading tonight. Um, and as I'm listening to that reading tonight and reflecting on um, where we are as a community, where we are as a country, um, how, our, how do our movements come together? Um, there's a lot to think about. I think our speaker shared earlier um, all of the, the issues that our country is facing. Um, and what I gained from or the gathered from the speech tonight, listening, and what I've learned over the years in continuing to listen is really the call for that spiritual awakening, um, the call to reclaim our spiritual energy and activism in this work that we do for social change around our Naochokuyo, our, our Mother Earth, and looking at the, the threats that continue to happen because of militariz militarization, um, domination, I, I speak from a community of less than, you know, 5,000 people in a pandemic. Um, and every elder that we've lost or every elder that we continue to lose because of this pandemic is a reminder of the stark history of this country. The lack of unified healthcare, universal healthcare, the strategic policies that have been in place to eradicate us as indigenous communities, the taking of our land, the taking of our air, the continued colonization, um, and now this nuclear colonization that is occurring. So when I listen to this speech tonight and I think about my brothers and sisters across the country, across the globe, and we're talking about the that we're dealing with the tomorrow today, right? We're dealing with the tomorrow today with Colin Kaepernick and Black Lives Matter, immigrant children in caves, in cages, and no dapple, land back, peaceful resistance and nonviolence. To the siege of the capital and to those words that tell us that those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. And yet it's not our BIPOC communities. It's not us who have turned to violence for the social change that we are demanding. It is those that fear our power those that fill our voice and those that fear our, vo our vote. Those that continue to lose violence and force to keep our peoples and our communities down. Dr. King urged us to undergo a radical revolution of values. And I wanna say here that we have not collectively acted. We have been dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time, reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. 
We lived that in this past administration. And as indigenous peoples, we've lived strategies and policies of genocide up until the 1930s, 1970s for sterilization of native women. This is the reality and the continued place of us in our country. Here in New Mexico, we are downwind from Los Alamos National Laboratory. So we know that that nuclear cycle is real from the mining to the testing, to the bombs that were dropped, our connection to Vietnam, our connection to our Asian brothers and sisters across this globe. How are we collectively acting as community members? How are we collectively asking and standing with our Black Lives Matter brothers and sisters? How are we collectively standing with our Asian brothers and sisters? As indigenous people, how are we continuing to stand and ask and demand that the lands that were taken, the dispossession that was happening, that these do not continue into the future for our country and our communities. So what is this new world that we are creating together? What does that look like? How do we continue to have these dialogues with our children, our young people who are now in their homes learning virtually? What is the spirit and energy that moves our communities and how do we bring that back, that heart, that spirit, that connection, that interconnection? And as the speaker before me talked about, that global citizenship that we have across this globe, around the militarization of our country, around the force that is used to maintain peace. How are we continuing to teach this to our young people? How are we continuing to bring this forward? I think our connection here is a small indigenous community in northern New Mexico to the global communities of our, of our brothers and sisters. How do we continue to make the soul transformations? How do we continue to make the spiritual transformations that Dr. Martin Luther King talked about? The energy in his voice as he spoke and as he moved people, the vibrations that occur all across this globe for our mother earth we are all dependent on this earth mother for our life sustaining and that continued militarization no matter how much it continues to go trillions and billions of dollars that contamination is impacting our ability to procreate in our communities our rivers to continue to feed us and as cultural spiritual beings and nurturers of our home bases of the, the no dapple and the land back that we continue to need the spiritual nurturing of our waters of our earth mother of our plants to continue to nurture us and so dr martin luther king in his global citizenship understood and talked about the experiences of the vietnamese people the peasant people and the impact that our military was having how do we continue to speak collectively and act collectively? How do we make our experiences the experiences of our, our global family and our global communities? How do we continue to build those alliances and those relationships that see us as that beloved family and community? This is what I'm taking from this, from this talk tonight, from this gathering. How do we bring it to our homes in this digital divide? How do we bring it to our communities and how do we nurture that connection um, that is needed to transform these systems? We, what we're seeing and what we saw at the US Capitol is that this two-party system is not working for us. How are we looking at the multiplicities of processes that can continue to grow and be strengthened that we really reflect those most impacted and continues to reflect our voices in that process and does continue to divide and separate us. And what we feel as mothers, what we feel as sisters and what Martin Luther King and others talked about in the movement is that the death of one of us is the impact that we all are going to continue to feel and we need to respond and come together in that collective action collective movement 
Kutawaha. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kareem, for that. Um, really sitting with that. Uh, the final speaker, and then we're going to have some conversation, is um, Medea Benjamin. Uh, Medea is the director of the Food Labor Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley, and president and co-founder of One Fair Wage. She's also co-founder um, of the social justice organization Code Pink, and a longtime fierce hellraiser and freedom fighter. And we're always happy to hear her voice. Medea, what are you thinking tonight? Well, certainly moved by hearing the speech again and by the other speakers. And I uh, was particularly struck, Corinne, when you talked about a couple of concepts such as might without morality and the issue of global citizenship. Those are two critical concepts. And when I listened to the speech, one thing that struck me was how uh, things have changed in terms of the way the U.S. wages war these days. And that was learned from the time of Vietnam, because when you had a draft and you had so many young American soldiers being killed, there was a huge youth movement, a huge anti-war movement. And now the way the wars are fought in a different way precisely to stop that kind of movement from growing. Uh, they're fought uh, by volunteer army, they're fought by proxy wars, uh, they're fought mostly by air power, a lot of uh, the use of drones. I did a study with uh, my colleague the uh, recently when we looked at the uh, number of airstrikes that the U.S. and its close allies have conducted since the war on terror began. And we looked at Iraq, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, and Palestine, and found out that the U.S. and its allies had been dropping 46 bombs a day, every single day, for the last 20 years. Now that's extraordinary and certainly confirms Martin Luther King's uh, message that the U.S. was the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Uh, there is something else that has changed as well, which is the U.S. conducts warfare uh, in an economic way through extremely violent and brutal sanctions that the U.S. is now imposing on countries like Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, Syria, North Korea. And this is too a kind of warfare uh, that kills oftentimes more people than the bombs kill and that is totally hidden from the American people, uh, but is a form of collective punishment. So we have a different way of waging war uh, outside of the, uh, the, the, the media for the most part, outside of the view of Americans. And we've been involved in so many of these wars now for two decades that for young people, they see it as part of the norm. Uh, that it's been very hard to build up the same kind of anti-war movement that we had during the days of Vietnam. And this means that we have a challenge that really goes back to the heart of what Martin Luther King was calling uh, the uh, evils of poverty, racism, militarism, and these days we add in the environmental crisis. But the only way to build a strong anti-war movement is to connect it to these other um, very strong movements and to show that the only way to transform our war economy uh, and to cut the power of the military industrial complex is through a Green New Deal. And that as we fight racism at home, we have to fight that same racism abroad, defunding the police has to be the same struggle as defunding the Pentagon, countering the uh, increase in hate crimes against the Asian American community has to go hand in hand with a campaign to show that China is not our enemy. So we confront a huge challenge, which is basically, how do we move the US from an empire to a nation among many nations uh, that doesn't have 800 bases overseas, that brings our troops home, uh, that has significant cut in the Pentagon budget, uh, that rids itself uh, as it tries to rid the world of nuclear weapons. Uh, the positive thing is that the American people are on our side, no matter which political party, uh, the people uh, are 
uh, sick and tired of the endless wars, just as people were tired of the uh, Vietnam War, which led us to many years of what was called the Vietnam Syndrome. And what we need is exactly what Martin Luther King called for, the revolution of values. And I would say that this is not related to political parties, whether it was Trump's crass America first or Biden's uh, call for the US to be back at the head of the table. It's the whole concept uh, that the US does not have the right. And of course, today it doesn't have the ability to be at the head of the table, dictating to the rest of the world how it should conduct its business uh, and how it should build its societies. And so our job is really um, to work uh, in conjunction with the domestic movements to build a foreign policy that is based on cooperation, nonviolence, and a good new neighbor policy that we have to devise as a way of relating to the world in a totally new way than we have been doing um, for since the time of the Vietnam War and even before that. Uh, and one that shares all the values that the other speakers have talked about tonight and is at the essence of Martin Luther King's speech. Thank you, Medea. Um, I wanna hone in on this, this the, the part of King's message that um, several of you have, have talked about and I often invoke uh, in, in speeches, which is this notion of a radical revolution of values. What does that look like in the 21st century? What does that look like in, um, in the context of what COVID has put into bold, the COVID crisis has put into bold relief? Um, and in light of the ongoing movements uh, that, are, that are in motion at this moment, the, uh, of course, 26 million people who were in motion uh, against po racist police violence, uh, young people who are leading new anti-war organizations like the dissenters and others, the uh, calls to action by the Movement for Black Lives and Frontline and the rising majority around uh, not only the Green New Deal, but the Red, Black and Green New Deal and others. What, what, what does that particular quote mean to us and call us to in this moment? Any thoughts on that? Anyone can go. Sure, I'll, I'll hop in. Uh, you know, I think that like, if I'm being honest, Dr. Ramsey, that the time for the radical revolution of values was when Dr. King called for it. Uh, that at this point in a 21st century context, I feel like a lot of people can fit the politics of values, of morals, right, of, of what is right, um, but don't often take the next step of, of actually turning that into action. And I think what we saw in 2020 was a, a more mass than we've ever seen in my lifetime people saying we're gonna put our bodies actually into practice, right? He said, sure, we need a radical revolution of values, but he also said that we needed to come up with every creative form of protest to make this thing a reality. And one without the other, I, I feel frankly, is just not enough, right? We've seen people like saying that the world needs to be a better place, that we should get rid of racism, that police brutality is bad, that we should do something to shift this economy away from something that's bad for the planet and bad for the people to something that's good for the planet and good for our people, et cetera. But we haven't necessarily seen the folks that we elect to champion do to, like actually use policy as a vehicle to make that so. I think secondarily, mm -hmm. we also haven't built the movements big and bad enough to build the, the, the alternatives to the state <laughs> that we need to be able to just, you know, practice mutual aid and collective liberation without codependency with the state. And I think that uh, if we only if we only settle for a radical revolution of values, I fear uh, that 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 will not a world save. Um, we mm -hmm. need to do both, and we can't afford not to. The values have to be reflected in our actions and our strategies and our commitments. Faith without um, works and, is dead. Yeah, there you go. Others, other thoughts on this? I have I have more questions than we have time. So if this one doesn't fit what you want to say. I got, I got part B. Bill, you look like you might want to add something. Just to say, I think what Ashley says is so smart. You know, we've come through this pandemic year and it should have taught us a, a few things, but, but maybe most deeply that, there, that, that we are in desperate need of a new kind of solidarity in this country and around this world. We can't deal with the crises we have now 
uh, as individuals one at a time. And we can't deal even with them one nation at a time. We have to be able to deal with them in the global way that Dr. King was suggesting. And that's hard and it's not something we've been good at. And it's the exact opposite of what Trumpism was all about. Um, um, but that's, that's what biology and physics and chemistry, as well as morality, call us to now in the deepest way. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. I think, I think that any? point of, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead, Karine. Corinne, Corinne. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I gotta yes. test. I gotta test out technology. Um, yes, I believe that, again, we do have to think about values what values are driving us. But I, I think what's lost in that translation is how do we live into these values and how do we collectively define these? Um, and I think that's the struggle that we've been. We've been talking with young people about core values and how our values just, just drive our decision making. And so if we're looking at just that microcosm of that individual student, and then we're trying to move to this capacity, this bigger capacity of our country, how do we get people to then take action on those values? How, what do we define in America and who is defining those values for us? You know, I, I grew up, you know, and I, all of us have listening to these different stories. And then we've also listened to adults um, say values and then do something different, right? And so mm -hmm. how then do we translate that? Because I feel like we're trying to get organizations, we're trying to get communities to come together around values, around um, having the, this justice, when justice has been so defined in different communities in different ways, then we get to this equity piece and what does equity look like in order for, for our communities to move to that place. So it's a, it's, I think it's a, it's a nice kind of way for us to kind of talk about this. But again, how are we translating that into these action items? How are we, how are we seeing ourselves reflected in this country, in, this com in our communities in that way from the diversity that we have how do we continue to move in that in that aspect? We've been working on a healing justice project with 21 organizations, trying to see how at what level are these organizations talking about values um, and how do we get to that place of then that real translation, right? How do we get to that place of vulnerable leadership? How do we get to that place of being authentically yourself when all of this country has been violence directed at us as brown native mm -hmm. women? And so how do we then, move and shape our movement so that we're we're coming to that place collectively and i feel like mm -hmm. that's still been our challenge what is our collective experience i think the pandemic has at least allowed us as a country and as a global community to experience something collectively together and still we have people resisting wearing masks we still have mm -hmm. people resisting yeah. um contributing to the community and the well-being of others beyond thinking about themselves, but really thinking collectively about others. And I feel that's the place of, of where we've come in this individualistic way that American values have been articulated. So now how mm -hmm. do we come together as collective BIPOC communities talking about collectively that experience and those values and how are we creating the spaces for us to talk about them? And I think Black Lives Matter has been one of the most powerful movements where I've seen that in my lifetime, seen that collective kind of movement. I come from a communal community, right? We're supposed to have these communal values. And yet sometimes there's people are, are still trying to weigh that individual um, rights and privilege as opposed to the communal um, needs of the whole. And so we're still mm -hmm. in that conflict as, as an American society. So how do we, how yeah. do we overcome that? How do we truly overcome Such that? Important. Yeah. Well, thank you. Such important questions. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I want to turn to, I want to give Medea a chance to jump in. And I also want to make sure we come back to what some of you have invoked in terms of the global what's happening in Yemen, Tigray, Palestine, uh, Burma, Myanmar, Haiti, you know, how do we see both values and practice uh, uh, shift toward a more progressive and radical vision um, on the global level in terms of foreign policy? Medea? Well, on the last issue, I think one of the uh, key things of the revolution of values uh, is to uh, see militarism as a problem, not a solution, and that 
perhaps today when we see that most of the public uh, puts at the top of the issues that concern the most uh, is not the fear of China or the fear of terrorism, but is the pandemic and other health issues, environmental crises, uh, inequality, racism, that these are things that cannot be dealt with through militarism. And that gives us a good start in terms of moving towards this revolution of values. And then when you put it into this global context, it is heartbreaking to see, for example, uh, in the case of Yemen, that our government from the time of Obama through the Trump years, and now uh, a Biden has put a halt, but it's not very clear uh, where that is going uh, in the weapons that, that we sell to the Saudis. This has become a huge business in the United States. And even in the Biden administration, they're now saying that it's important to keep this relationship with the repressive regime like the Saudis um, and uh, uh, and that uh, keeps us involved in a war in Yemen that we should have never been involved in and we should always have been uh, speaking out against. Uh, so I think as long as we have a war economy, it's very hard for us to uh, stop selling weapons to repressive regimes or even giving weapons to repressive regimes like Israel or Egypt. Uh, and that's why I think that uh, the Green New Deal is so critical in terms of moving away uh, from uh, an economy where it's not just the big weapons manufacturers that profit from war and the defense contractors or the military contractors, uh, but it's also millions of US jobs that are dependent on this war economy that needs to be shifted. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um... So I'm gonna shift now to the questions that have uh, come from the audience. People have been patiently listening to all your, your brilliance and, um, and insights and, and they have some questions. So I'm gonna throw out three questions that have been passed on to me uh, from, from the listeners. And we have um, over a thousand people listening on various platforms. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, one question was, how do we see the link between the uh, criticism and vitriol that Dr. King experienced after his speech uh, in 1967, after the Be Beyond Vietnam speech, uh, and the climate that led to his assassination. I'm going to give you three questions, and um, I don't want each of you to answer all three. You can pick one. Um, and the second question is, Dr. King talked about learning from opposition. How do we learn from our opposition? That's a tricky one. And then finally, um, what, it, what is your assessment of the Poor People's Campaign as a, um, a part of, of carrying on Dr. King's legacy? Anyone, any question? Many doors into the house, my friends. Well, let me, I, I, I'll just say that, the, um, that it's, one of, it's been one of the happy events of the last few years to see uh, uh, Reverend Barber and others pick up the mantle of the Poor People's Campaign um, and bring it forward into our time and expand it to include um, all the issues that we're talking about tonight. Um, and that fits very closely with the first question about the vitriol directed at Dr. King. People did not want Dr. King talking about, it really did, you know, people would have been just as happy if he hadn't talked about anything, I think, but they certainly didn't want him talking about anything other than, uh, you know, stay in your lane, talk about segregation, and that's that. And as Dr. King, uh, 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 as Dr. King matured and began to talk more and more and more about economic inequality, about militarism, um, it became harder and harder for the power structure in this society to deal with him. Uh, and, 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 you know, the day after he gave that talk at Riverside Church, the New York Times devoted an entire editorial to telling him to get back in his lane, that he was doing damage to the civil rights movement by talking about anything else. Well, um, thank God he did not stay in his lane. And thank God there are others now who are taking up all these fights and figuring out how to unite them in powerful ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Others, as, Ashley. As, as the uh, first black woman executive director of the Highlander Research and Education Center, even before I was in that role, uh, Willie Baptiste in the, in the Poverty Initiative, 
lots of really great organizations like About Faces, formerly known as Iraq Veterans Against the War, many other organizations were consistently meeting at Highlander to talk about the legacy of the Poor People's Campaign, the need for it. This is like early, early 2000s. Um, and Moral Monday exploded and Dr. Reverend Dr. Barber uh, and, and the Moral Monday movement started participating in those meetings and now look at where it is. I mean, I think uh, the, the powerful thing about the Poor People's Campaign is that it's bigger than any one org and any one human, uh, just like the civil rights movement and the black liberation struggles of the 60s and 70s. What makes what makes the camp this 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 huge social movement that is is to me the defining uh, the defining point of of what is expected of the Biden Harris administration and of the 117th Congress came from lots of different folks that were getting in where they could fit in around building a movement that was bigger than the sum of our parts. So what do I think about the Poor People's Campaign? I think it's awesome. I think it's one piece of a big puzzle uh, that is making a lot of things happen. Um, and then you know. I think that that these other two questions actually link. So I know you told me not to answer all three of them. I'm gonna barb. <laughs> so the, just to say it really succinctly, and this sort of rolls back to something that Bill was saying earlier, like this question of solidarity, right? What I'm seeing in the opposition actually is that they are practicing it. That solidarity is a doing word to them. That they are coming together across difference, right? If we think about Charlottesville, that's an example of like white supremacist, nationalist, populist. Or secular and religious organizations coming together across their differences because they're scared about becoming a numerical minority and they're scared about communities of color and working class people actually having some self determination power, right? Like that's actually what it was. What we saw on January 6th was people coming together, regardless of borders, regardless of class background, regardless of faith, regardless of class saying we don't think that those black that that black led multiracial working class rooted united front that got biden and harris into the seat actually should be able to say who governs this country they are working together not only domestically but even to the global question that you that you asked barbara it's like the 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 white supremacists that attacked the highlander center back in march of 2019 put a symbol in our parking lot that was that was etched into the gun that the that the white supremacists used to shoot up christchurch new zealand Right. These folks are working together. And as, as, even though Trump said that he had an America first strategy, he was working with fascists and Nazis all across the world, authoritarians all across mm. the world. So they are building yeah. a global movement. So should we. So should we. We've got to be building mm -hmm. a multi tactical United Front. Great. That's why Movement for Black Lives has a has a global uh, committee. Right. That's right. Um, okay, uh, Corrine or Medea, you want to weigh in on one of these questions, and then I have one more uh, question. I have there's a number of questions in the chat, but I have another one for you all too. You want to weigh in on one of these? You want to wait for the next round? Medea, Corrine. Go ahead. Go ahead, Corrine. Hello. Yes, I want to say a uh, big yes to, to Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign, most definitely. I think the ways that we can highlight and bring to the consciousness of our young people, um, our communities, our rural communities across this nation, um, the more that we can then continue to be pulling our energy um, to move and change systems and um, learning from the opposition. I think that's been a strategy from all of us since the beginning of time, um, sending us to, to American schools so that we could learn the system, right? And then coming back mm -hmm. into our communities and figuring out how we can make and transform. Um, but that's a double-edged sword. Um, again, there's this indoctrination, there's this like su white supremacy, do um, domination is like water across this globe. And once we get a little taste of privilege, then how, are, how, do, we, how do we undo our own privilege in that process? I think that that's the, again, that double-edged sword of us being in, in the belly of the beast here in America. Um, you know, trying to, to, to look in and those shifts. And, and I think the more that we become global and because we've, I, I speak from my experience as, you know, against a small reservation girl that didn't necessarily travel a lot and then had this experience to be able to go to the Highlander Institute, to be go, able to go across mm -hmm. the globe as a young person to really see and experience that, hey, colonization and genocide have not stopped. 
those are continued strategies that that's being used across this globe by the rich, right? And that's who is really trying to keep us disempowered. Those that are wanting to continue to make the money and make the money no matter where that is, that globalization of the world is about that economic seeping into that capitalism, seeping into every corner of this earth. Um, and being mm -hmm. able to travel as a young person and experience those um, conferences, those so those sessions, talking, going through the World Conference on Women, I think that really helped to increase that perspective um, and that sharing across communities, right? I in my in my early schooling, I went to an all Indian school. It's our, our community day school, and then from that went to public school so that I could broaden my perspective, or my parents felt that I could broaden that perspective. So how are we continuing to create these opportunities and experiences for our most disenfranchised young? people in this country um, where we often talk about politics we forget the the middle of this country um, and that's where a lot of where mm -hmm. where we saw this past administration win votes right so how are we really mm -hmm. communicating um, to all across the world and in and, and in our communities again those privileges that we have and those that we have to do just um, disown and how do we practice mm -hmm. that on an individual level because if we want to get to that global perspective it's going to be a, all, all of us coming together to say how are we how are we um, letting go of some of the privilege and the ways that we oppress other people right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you for that reminder and that that challenge and provocation Medea we only have about five minutes uh, left sadly uh, the hour went fast but what are your thoughts on one of these questions? One of the things we can uh, learn from the opposition is when uh, Trump was in the White House, how uh, popular the ideas of getting out of the endless wars were and how um, popular the idea of bringing the troops home, whether it was from Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria. And uh, so I think Biden should recognize that and go ahead and do what Trump said he was going to do, but didn't do, which to, is to actually bring them home. Learning from our mm -hmm. adversaries is also not just learning from the uh, Republicans or, or, or white supremacists, but it's also learning from uh, our adversaries globally. And I think in the case of China, we can learn that you make more friends in the world by uh, investing economically than by bombing countries. Uh, we can learn from... Uh, other countries how to deal with COVID much better than we have, including the small island nation of Cuba that's about to come out with its vaccine. Uh, we can learn from Iran uh, that the U.S. just cannot impose its will uh, like it thinks it can anymore. And it's been sad to see the Biden administration wait and make things more complicated in terms of getting back into the Iran nuclear deal, because that could lead us to another war in the Middle East. And uh, I think we have to learn uh, that the world does see us as the hypocrites when we have thousands of nuclear weapons yet tell other countries they can't have any. Uh, while we don't want any countries to have nuclear weapons, uh, we should recognize that there is now a UN treaty that says there uh, should be a global ban on nuclear weapons and our job uh, is to push that onto our own government. Thank you so much. Um, we are coming to the end of our time together. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy, Corrine, you brought up this question of capitalism, which, which came up implicitly before, but, you know, dealing with and confronting uh, the ravages of racial capitalism in the 21st century is so important. And I think throughout all of your work and remarks tonight, the importance of speaking truth to power. Uh, we were all glad to get uh, Trump out of the White House, but now we also have to keep up the pressure on this new administration. Uh, to, to, to go as far as we can push them to go. The last question I'm gonna try to squeeze in and I'm gonna be really unfair and ask you to give a one word answer if you can, which is uber succinct. Uh, a young person who is a high school student said that they were very inspired by listening to all of you this evening and want advice about what the role of young people are and what young people can do uh, in this moment. And I'm gonna ask you to think of one word that you wanna tell that young person before we segue to the closing. Bill, what are you thinking? Um, young people are leading, <laughs> young people are leading right now, at least in the climate fight and a lot of others. And so they gotta just keep it up, man. Um, and the rest of us have a duty to try and follow where they're leading. Okay, that was 13 words, gotcha. Mm -hmm. 
Corrine, I'm, I'm just teasing. Corrine. Revolutions live in you. Revolutions live in okay. you. Okay. All right. Medea. Two words, be radical. Gotcha. We've, we've seen you stand up to a, a, enough folks of uh, <laughs> situations to follow that lead. Uh, Ashley. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I can't do the one word I tried. Um, I would say don't no, be scared right. of power. You've got it, it's yours. Don't be scared to fail, mm -hmm. you will. You're not perfect. Um, to study, mm -hmm. to practice, sum it up and do it again. Great. Great messages. I knew you wouldn't all say one word, but if I said one word, I'd get like two sentences. So very, very powerful sentences uh, for our closing. So I want to thank our fabulous uh, panel members. Um, I want to thank the interpreters, both the Spanish interpreter and the sign language interpreters uh, for making this program uh, more accessible. Um, and there's more than a thousand people who watch this program, so it's wonderful. I want to also give a special thanks to the co-producers who helped present uh, King uh, Breaking the Silence, the SNCC Legacy Project, the National Council of Elders, the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, the Highlander Center, the National Black Justice Coalition, the National Civil Rights Museum, Fellowship of Reconciliation, the Zen Education Project, Voices of a People's History, the Shalom Center, uh, and one of the producers, the National Civil Rights Museum, also marks today uh, Dr. King's assassination each year the museum has kindly shared media that they produced for their commemoration, which was broadcast earlier this evening as a part of remembering MLK, the man, the movement, and the moment. We're pleased to share it, and we invite people to join us over the next year to extend further this call for unity and action. Thank you. Precious Lord.